Kristen McKenzie. I am uh, one of the current Bay Medicine Fellows that actually just finished today. Um, a little bit more about myself. I am a Bay Area native. I grew up in Fremont. Um, I went to medical school at UCSF and then uh, stayed at Stanford for anesthesia residency and pain fellowship and will now be staying on as faculty. So my outline tonight is um, first just briefly touching on the problem of chronic pain, then discussing ongoing inflammation in chronic pain um, and diet considerations that you can take into account and different supplements, since that's always a question that we get asked a lot by our patients. My goals for this lecture are to encourage you to kind of think more broadly about why some chronic pain conditions can occur and how nutrition could conceivably address these conditions. And I would just like to offer the caveat that I want you to feel empowered to discuss with your doctor if any of these changes might be a good fit for you. We all know there's so many personal elements of nutrition and diet, um, including like what medical conditions you have, such as diabetes or heart disease, what you enjoy doing for activity, what you personally enjoy eating and maybe have cultural connections to what you like to eat. Um, how many hours you have to dedicate to meal planning and preparation and what your budget is. So we know that the best diets or best nutrition plans are the ones that people can stick to. So um, I just would encourage you to have that discussion with your provider um, at a visit if it's something you're interested in. So in terms of chronic pain in the United States, it's estimated that it's between five and six hundred billion dollars spent annually um, on costs of pain and chronic pain, which is more than heart disease, cancer, and diabetes combined. And we have the possibility that this will even increase as chronic illnesses increase. So when we think about normal inflammation, such as if you got a paper cut or another injury, what will happen? So in this case, inflammation is adaptive. It's a way that the wound becomes hot and red, more blood flow gets diverted to the wound, which brings healing mediators and allows the wound to heal. Um, and that's a normal process that I think we are all familiar with. And it can be painful and tender as more blood and more inflammation goes to that site to help it heal. But we think that in chronic pain states, inflammation has kind of gone awry or gone out of check, um, where either there wasn't an injury to begin with, or the injury is not going to heal on its own, but yet there is prolonged inflammation. And one of the ways that we can show this is by checking blood for elevated markers of inflammation. These are things such as the C-reactive protein that we can measure in the blood and the TNF alpha that we can measure in the blood. And studies have shown that these are elevated in conditions such as chronic low back pain and fibromyalgia, neuropathic pain. And we think that chronic pain has basically long-term immune system activation from this out of sync balance where you have continuous release of pro-inflammatory substances. And at the same time, you have decreased anti-inflammatory substances. And so while we're holding that in our minds about why we think there is increased inflammation and chronic pain, kind of want to present this idea of the so-called Western diet, which is thought to be pro-inflammatory. This is a diet that is high in processed food, processed carbs, salt, chemicals, preservatives, and is often poor in fiber, micronutrients, and antioxidants. Obviously, what is predicted depicted here is probably maybe like the worst part of that spectrum. But I think that we can um, all agree that we live in a culture where we're not always eating fresh, unprocessed food. And it's often um, not what's available to us in um, kind of at the drop of a hat. So when we look at what an anti-inflammatory diet looks like, that's a diet that's high in non-starchy vegetables, fruits, legumes, nuts, seeds, healthy oils, and whole grains. 
And the overarching idea is that it helps balance tissue pH level for optimal mitochondrial enzyme functioning. I think the easiest example of the anti-inflammatory diet in um, our like recognizable culture is the Mediterranean diet, which is typically high in vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, nuts and seeds, and olive oil. Um, you can see this beautiful food pyramid on the side, which, you know, I think is kind of what we inspire to eat. Um, and there's been some studies of the Mediterranean diet. Um, the first one is this New England Journal article that was came out in 2003, which basically looked at a Greek population and looked at how they adhered to their a Mediterranean diet and how long they lived and found that a Mediterranean diet may reduce all cause of death, may reduce the risk of cardiac events. I do want to offer kind of a caveat to that, which is um, it was looking at a Greek population who culturally grew up eating this diet from probably a really young age, had easy access to these foods and have other um, unmeasurable uh, differences to America, such as maybe daily activity or closeness of family um, that can interact with psychological well-being and other markers for living a long, healthy life. So there's a lot that it's hard to apply to the United States when we look at that, but there is a signal that it may reduce death and cardiac events. And then I think perhaps more applicable to us, there was a study in 2018 in a rheumatologic journal, which looked at osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis pain and found that patients who adhere to a Mediterranean diet had improved pain and improved function. Um, so I think that's maybe more applicable to our population here. I wanna offer a few more caveats here. So Mediterranean diets, they don't exist in a vacuum. They're part of a healthy lifestyle, which have many components, such as daily activity. Um, food is often expensive when you look at this pyramid. Um, Fresh fruits and vegetables don't keep that long. They require multiple trips to the store. Fish is very expensive. Um, and I think it becomes challenging for us to shop, prepare, and find a way to adhere to this diet given a lot of our daily constraints. Um, some of the things that can be done to make it a little bit easier are buying beans and complex grains in bulk and soaking them. Uh, there's studies that show canned and frozen fruits and vegetables are often nutritionally similar to fresh fruits and vegetables. And purchasing, again, in bulk, things like frozen fish, bulk nuts can be purchased at stores like Costco. But I would say even with these kind of tips and tricks, we know that it can be very challenging um, to adhere to this type of diet. Um, this paper is kind of what I wanted to spend the next part of the talk um, going over. It is out of Italy in 2018. And this group put together a food pyramid for subjects with chronic pain and essentially built their own kind of food pyramid to use as an example for clinicians to discuss with their patients. Um, how they did this study was they conducted a literature review and looked for studies that um, basically showed foods that decreased inflammation. So there were very few studies that actually looked at pain markers or pain responses when consuming these foods. Instead, they're kind of drawing a, a big arrow from, if we decrease inflammation, then that will decrease chronic pain. So again, it's not a high quality study, but it's an interesting way of conceptualizing how you might be able to decrease inflammation in your body through diet. So this is the pyramid that they put together. Um, I want to draw your attention to the bottom of the pyramid where they really feel like the base of the pyramid, what you should be doing every day is staying very hydrated. Again, if you have medical conditions that will allow that. Um, and even quote a study where 
They look at what the pain response is from humans and find that you're much more sensitive in a dehydrated state um, versus in a hydrated state, uh, which isn't something that you know we think about kind of on a daily basis. The rest falls in with the Mediterranean diet that we've already um, outlined. It is interesting that when the Italians studied this, they found a Mediterranean diet, which is similar to their own diet to be the most effective. Um, and, you know, I think we can acknowledge that as a source of bias. Um, but most of the recommendations I'm going to go through come from this study. So in terms of fruits and vegetables, um, they show that consumption of fruits and vegetables are inversely correlated with markers of inflammation and oxidative stress. And fruits and vegetables are also great sources of fiber. And we notice that when fiber is fermented by bacteria in the colon, it actually can reduce inflammation of the mucosa. And they studied this in um, patients who have a history of ulcerative colitis. So I think it's um, a good key point to think about fiber is important, but also um, micronutrients in addition to like C, E, folate are all um, important for good neural functioning which transmits uh, the pain signals. So there's a lot of benefits to incorporating fruits and vegetables into your diet. Uh, this uh, slide kind of reminds me of, of like elementary school or something when they go over, you know, your my plate serving sizes. But I think it's always a good reminder for what a cup of leafy vegetables looks like, a half cup, and that even things like vegetable juice um, does provide you nutrients as well and can count as part of a vegetable serving. So the thought that olive oil um, is anti-inflammatory is one that a lot of studies have looked at. And they found several different studies in this kind of review article that confirm that. And they recommend about 10 milliliters um, a few tablespoons every day, something as you can uh, season your food with. They say preferably raw, which means not used with cooking. But I personally feel like even though you might lose some of the antioxidant activity from heating the oil, that the benefits often would outweigh the risks of using different oils, which don't have as many benefits and still have the same fat content. So I would say whenever you have the option to substitute olive oil, especially extra virgin olive oil instead of canola oil or other oils, that that's a good move. Obviously not applicable to every recipe. This is a, a favorite debate, red meat versus white meat. And I think the thought is that thing, both of these are okay in moderation, but shouldn't be the central part of any diet. So higher red meat consumption, when they looked at diabetes-free women, they found that these women who consumed more red meat had unfavorable plasma concentrations of inflammatory and glucose metabolic biomarkers. So showed that they were having more inflammation in their body with higher red meat consumption. If you substituted another food such as poultry, it, there was a healthier biomarker profile noted. And what this study um, from Italy concludes is that white meat is probably appropriate twice per week, red or processed meat, maybe more like once per meat. In terms of fish, um, the main uh, benefit here is large amounts of omega-3 um, fatty acids. Um, the fishes that are best for this are bluefish, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, tuna, and swordfish. Um, but I've also seen other sources that uh, call out salmon. Um, essentially, usually fattier fish, um, the more wild versus farmed, it usually has a better profile. So it depends, again, where you're going to source it. But I think ultimately, it's probably not worth splitting hairs given the increased cost. And if you're trying to incorporate these things into your diet, um, you should feel comfortable incorporating farmed fish if it 
you know, is more um, attainable to you than wild fish. And I think one of the reasons that I would say, you know, just prioritize it is um, they're saying four times per week. So I don't know that it's really realistic that we're going to have wild caught salmon <laughs> four times a week. But um, any way that you can try to incorporate it um, into your meal plans could definitely be beneficial. Legumes are one of the other cornerstones of the Mediterranean diet. Most of these can be purchased um, dry and in bulk, and then they can be reconstituted um, by soaking overnight. There is a noted decrease in inflammatory markers when eating legumes regularly, and the recommendation from this paper is about four times per week, and that they are also a good source of fiber. Soy um, has anti-inflammatory effects as well. And there was this interesting study that I wanted to mention that um, showed there was a reduction in pain symptoms in patients with osteoarthritis who were supplemented with 40 grams per day of soy proteins for three months. Um, I would also offer as a caveat here that three months of 40 grams per day of soy protein is, is a lot. And um, that's something that you would definitely probably wanna talk with your clinician about before starting. And I'm not really sure that that's sustainable in the long run, but it is kind of an interesting signal that there might be something there. And especially if you're looking for ways to replace, say, a red meat with a soy helping, it could, in the long run, again, as part of a diet that you feel like you can stick to for a long period of time, be helpful. Um, they include lots of information about nuts. I think also ultimately recommending something like 30 grams per day of nuts, which is a lot of nuts. Um, walnuts and pistachios are the ones that they felt like would be most beneficial based on their um, anti-inflammatory um, uh, makeup. So, you know, again, these are both on the more expensive side of nuts, things that could be probably and should be purchased in bulk. I don't know how I personally would incorporate 30 grams of nuts a day, but I think you could consider replacing like an afternoon snack or adding to morning cereal, see how you can try and fit them into your life and incorporate them into your diet. Yes, there's the 30 grams per day number. Eggs, kind of a mixed bag. There are some parts that are helpful. There are some parts that might be less helpful. Um, in general, it seems that the debate comes down to omega-3s versus omega-6s, both of which are part of eggs, um, but you want the omega-3s to be the more dominant part. Um, there are omega-3 eggs available for purchase at grocery stores, which they make more omega-3 rich by changing the diet of the chickens. Um, and usually there is an increased price tag associated with those as well, but it's an option if you are the type of person who eats a lot of eggs. I think the recommendation from this paper was try and limit to two times a week for eggs. And then this is one of my favorite quotes from the paper is, do not underestimate the positive effect of dark chocolate. And they say a minimum 70% of cocoa solids. Um, they say that's able to reduce nitric oxide production and oxidative stress thanks to its flavonoid content. Um, so gotta love the Italians for putting that in there. Uh, consume sparingly is still a recommendation and to choose dark chocolates over processed sweets when you have a chance. Supplements are things that we get asked about a lot. And I think that this was also uh, previously covered in Dr. Perez's talk um, with some of the supplements that we recommend to our chronic pain patients in clinic. Um, I wanted to go over the ones that were mentioned in this paper, because again, at the top of the pyramid, they do call out a few supplements that they feel could be beneficial to chronic pain patients. Um, and again, you know, that's a big variety of people of pain from all sorts of different causes, muscle, bone, nerve, um, so, you, you know, take it with a grain of salt here, but these are a few that they felt um, could be important, especially if you were deficient. So vitamin D, um, low levels are associated with inflammation, susceptibility to illness. And in, if you look at people who have chronic pain, a lot are vitamin deficient 
and it's correlated with their muscle fatigue risk factors. So I would recommend having your primary check a level if you feel like you don't get a lot of sun and, um, or if you're suffering from, you know, more muscle fatigue complaints, easy to check a level. Often it's included in your annual physical anyways. Here in California, we are at a part where we don't get a ton of sun um, every day. So it actually is hard to get your full amount of vitamin D from just being outside. Um, and of course, we encourage you to wear sunscreen and that also decreases your vitamin D. So supplementation is easy and can easily be addressed through your primary care doctor if it's something that you're concerned about. Vitamin B12 is a uh, vitamin that we associate with nerve functioning, um, but also has been shown to improve pain, insomnia, and fatigue. It's usually found in animal foods such as meat, fish, eggs, and so vegan diets are often um, deficient. Also, you can have diseases such as pernicious anemia, where you may be deficient in vitamin B12 as well. So again, if you feel like you have a neuropathy that is not being fully addressed, it is good to check a vitamin B level through, again, your primary care doctor and engage in supplementation if you are low. Fiber is another important element of any diet. Um, and the recommendation is for 30 grams per day in a ratio of three to one between insoluble and soluble fiber, and to make sure that you have an adequate intake of water. Helps with the glycemic response to the diet by slowing absorption of sugars. Um, like the previous study that we talked about in ulcerative colitis patients, uh, when metabolized, it's shown to decrease inflammation in the gut and ultimately helps with constipation, um, which can be another significant source of pain for our patients, especially those who are on chronic um, opioids. The last one I will talk about is omega-3 fatty acids. Um, we already talked about how they're found in fatty fish. Plant sources include flaxseed and algae. And some studies have even shown regular consumption is equivalent for joint pain to NSAIDs, which is kind of impressive. Um, I think those studies were very small uh, focused populations, so not um, as applicable to our general clinic, but an interesting finding. Uh, the note is here that you have to take pretty high doses. Um, so it's like between 1800 milligrams of EPA and 1200 milligrams of DHA. So you really have to kind of check the labels and make sure that um, you get enough. Um, as far as I know, there's not a ton of downside to just supplementing. I don't think there's any labs that you can check to see if you are deficient. Um, it can thin the blood. So just being aware of that. Um, and sometimes my patients tell me that they have to buy many and take many pills, which can be a burden on top of their usual medications. And the last thing I'll mention here is turmeric and ginger, just because it comes up a lot. They're both from tuber roots. They've both been extensively studied for anti-inflammation. Um, the caveat that I wanna offer here is that um, sometimes just taking it as a capsule, we don't know what, what the absorption is like. It seems like um, may benefit from heating with oil, pepper. So if you can find a way to cook with these, it might actually be more beneficial than just taking a pill. But again, there's not really good studies or data on this. So that concludes my portion of the talk.